All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show with Alice from Sender One Climbing. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. On the background, we were talking about you were defining what a parachute kid is. So this is going to be a little different episode. Okay. We're going to go back and this is a crazy story. All right, so go ahead. So tell us, you were asking me if I know what a parachute kid is. Yeah. I said, no idea. What is it? So a parachute kid is when your parents bring you to America or wherever and they drop you off and they leave. They leave. So I came here... I moved around a lot when I was a kid. I I went to 10 different schools until like up until sixth grade in like Taiwan, in the Solomon Islands, in Australia, in the U.S. And then when I was 13, my mom said, you know what? We're taking you to school in the U.S. and you have to just figure out how to make it. So you're 13 years old and your mom parachutes you, drops you off into what what part of America? So it was here uh, in California, in California, in Palos Verdes. Okay. She had a friend from college that lived down the street from us. From me. From so you. she rented an apartment. A one bedroom apartment? A two bedroom apartment two, right okay. next to the school. And it was like next to a pavilion, next to, you know, a Burger King. So I can buy my own groceries. I can do everything. And then her friend would come over and sign my permission slips. But I didn't tell him, but I didn't tell anybody You're about it. You're skipping so time. much here. Yeah. So you are <laughs> okay. living alone. I'm living alone as a 13 year old. Yes. And, and it was totally illegal, which is why I didn't tell anybody. It was illegal? Yeah. yeah I think they call it neglect like, today. Yeah, I'm not sure. sure so what year was this when you moved here? How old were you? So 13? I think I was, so what it year was 1994. Was that? All right, pre-internet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy, okay. Yeah. Which is kind of nice. You can get away with it then. Different yeah. era. Yeah. So you're 13 years old. How often are you communicating with your parents? So that's the thing. Do you remember back then? It was it was like fax machines. It was faxing yeah. her notes. Collect, call, collect. And then, no, it was like international calls, but it was $3 right. a minute to call like okay. MCI or something to call my parents or call my mom. <laughs> that's exactly So MCI, I did it. Yeah. I called her maybe once a month and I would just write faxes to her and tell her I was okay. And what was the update? What, what was like, I'm earth? alive. I'm eating. I'm doing okay in school. <laughs> How would you get money? So her friend, her friend who lived down the street would just bring me money and write just okay, so your parents and, and the friend that lived down the street had some sort of agreement, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Okay, so when this happened, were you like, all right, mom, no problem. How long am I going to be alone for? Was there any semblance of they're going to they're gonna try to immigrate over here? What's, what is that like? Or so was see, it known for you to be alone? You're you going to be alone forever. A lot of people ask me about that experience. And when I was going through it, I'm sure people, like, people who went through war or traumatic experiences, when you're going through that experience, it didn't feel traumatic. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it, by the way, I'm not assuming yeah. it was traumatic. Well, I think I've done a lot of processing now and I think, wow, it's pretty traumatic. But at the time it was just my life. So my dad passed away when I was young, my mom, and she was, this is like her third husband by the time she, uh, this had happened. How old was you, was, were you when your dad passed away? He, I was three. So I was very young and my mom married two other times after that. But my stepdad had cancer and she was starting a business with him and the business was not going well. So she needed to take care of him and my brother, who was like six at the time. Okay. So it was just, it's in her knew. mind, it yeah. was just, there was no choice. Like if I either I was gonna go to boarding school in Australia or I was gonna come here for school in the US, but we were, they, were living, they were starting a business in the Solomon Islands and there were no schools there. It was a third world country. So basically it was go to America, try to figure it out. Otherwise, that, there's no other option. It's kind of amazing. It was really crazy. It's yeah. like a movie. And how did you find yeah. community? How did you find it? Like just making friends. Was it easy? Uh, was it straight? Like what was that like when you got here? I feel really lucky because some of my best friends are still my friends from high school. Okay. They took care of me. They took me in for Thanksgiving. At what point did you tell them? Like you're like, oh, I live alone. Did like you... maybe a year into it. Like for <laughs> okay. the first year, I didn't tell anybody because I just didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah. As I got to know them better, I would just tell them. I'd be like, hey, by the way, like, nobody lives in my house with me. It's just me. Like, and- every night I go to bed alone <laughs> at 13. Yeah. And did you do anything reckless? Were you partying with no, all this unsuper? No, that's the thing. Like, I totally could have dropped out of school, but I was a good student. Like, I studied really hard because I just, I just had this instinct that I needed to survive and make it. And, and I so got the discipline good grades. Self- like, I went to UCLA. My mom had never asked me. She never helped me with school, like homework or anything. Like I called her and said, hey, I need $800 to take this SAT class so I can go to college. Or like, I need tutoring or I need help. I would just rely on my friends and people around me. And you know what's crazy? is like, I definitely wasn't alone. There were other kids in that the were same parachute boat? kids. Yeah. I, I knew some people like in that your were own community? Kids in my own community. Yeah. From but other we places? Like this, people didn't talk about it. They don't talk about they it. They don't talk about it. I've never heard this until this yeah. moment. Like you asked me before. That's why it's a ter- I didn't. I learned kids. this term because somebody told me that was what it was called. It was a parachute kid. I mean, I guess I've heard of it in some yeah. way where it's like a grandparent or something, but never like this where you're literally living alone. Yeah. And then you remain focused on school. Mm-hmm. And so it was almost like, 
not to use the war analogy that you used before, but it was almost like you were serving a mission here. Like mm-hmm. you were on a mission. Yeah. To do well in school, to survive. Yeah, to make it. Yeah. And you always had everything you needed. Well, the thing is, like, I, I'm very grateful for my mom because she went and started and started her business and did everything to send me money so I totally. could have an education. There's bravery on both ends. Right. Yeah. It was very brave. But what's funny was when I got to college, I remember I went to UCLA and when I moved into the dorms, I was like, oh, this is so awesome. I have a roommate. And my roommate was like crying because she was, you know, away from home. And I was like, what are you talking about? This is so easy. I've been doing this for four years. <laughs> was, was like, oh, my God. All right. So let's park that conversation okay. there. And so Sender One Climbing, when did you start that? How often or how soon after school did you enter that world? Okay, or so, entrepreneurship even? Yeah, I'll go back. So I went to UCLA. Out of UCLA, I was an investment banker. Okay. I did the thing that Asian kids do to make their parents proud, right? Work on Wall Street. Didn't like that at all. And <laughs> I hilarious. ended up leaving my job. Um, how long I, did you do it? Two years. And then I left my job. I got into the toy industry. So I got a job working at Mattel, crunching numbers. And I discovered, you know, I'm actually pretty good. I was really good at uh, sales. What did you major yeah. in? International economics. Okay. But I didn't learn anything in school that like helped me with my business. Of course not. That's how that goes. Yeah, that's yeah. how it goes. They're different. They're different. I got into the toy industry and I worked at Mattel and I worked in the toy industry for 12 years at four different toy companies. Oh my God. Yeah, so it was a really cool. I actually really liked it. What did you, yeah. so were you a quant? What, what kind of numbers were you running? Just like sales reports. And then eventually um, I had a mentor, I had a boss who took care of me and he said, hey, you know what? You're pretty good at selling. You're pretty good at working with buyers. Do you want to try to go into sales? So then from there I got into sales. I had my own account. I worked on Target. I was selling toys. I was going to Minneapolis selling toys to Target. Okay. And then I uh, started, <laughs> I got into like international sales. So in the course of the 12 years in toys, I went from like domestic sales to running international distributors and like building a couple of brands internationally. So that was really fun, actually. I enjoyed every day of it. All right. So yeah. Parachute Kid, UCLA, you are loving college, banking. investment banking, toy company, running numbers, sales. Okay. Yeah. And then all of this, at what point, your hobby, I would imagine, has to, right. do, has to be climbing? Is that true? Yeah. So this is the story. You haven't heard this part yet. So I have not. I had a very serious boyfriend okay. in investment banking. And we were together for five years. And we were going to get married. And he, his family was from Hong Kong. So... You know, it was like 2006, I guess. And uh, he was going to move back to Hong Kong. He had gotten an offer from this company in Hong Kong. So I said, hey, you know what? So I, I got an offer for, with my company in Hong Kong as well. So I wanted to move with him. So right before we moved, he told me, hey, you know what? I don't want you to move. For me, I want you to move if you actually want to go to Asia. And I said, well, why would I do that? Because I don't have any, I don't have any, I don't know anybody. I, the only person I know is you. And we'd been together for five years and we should get married because everybody was getting married, right? When I was 26 years old. But ended up, we broke up because like we just couldn't agree on this. On the Hong Kong issue. On the Hong Kong thing. So, but I was too proud. My stuff was already on a boat to Hong Kong and I got this job offer. So I ended up going to Hong Kong by myself. In without him? Without him in what? 2006. Okay. But when I got there, I found out that he got married. Like when I got there. He got married when? Like right after, maybe six months after we broke up. Yeah. And I was what devastated. On, what uh, what no, is a, happening right now? It is right a good story now. though. You'll what? see. Yeah. So you break up so over break Hong up. Kong. I'm living in then Hong Kong by Hong myself. Kong, and then boom, you're alone again and he's married. And I was so depressed. Like I didn't get out of bed for about a month. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's gotta be shocking. It was terrible. And, and, then, and you were like... Did you guys talk after the breakup a little bit? Yeah, a little Just bit. I mean, look, we, we had been together for a long time. And oh, it is, shit. you know, anyways. This is like so Jerry in Springer 07, stuff. Okay. So in 2007, I um, decided to leave Hong Kong. I decided to go to London. Is he still because, happily married? Yeah, he's still married to the same woman. I'll get there. I'm going to get there, I promise. Land so, the plane. Jesus. 2007, I moved to London because <laughs> I was trying to get out of okay. Hong Kong. Got it. So I get to London and then I decided, you know what? It was really cold in the wintertime and I just needed to get out of this, like, get, not getting out of bed thing. So I went to a climbing gym for the first time. In, in London. In London. So the first time I climbed in a climbing gym was Never in done 2007 in London. And it changed my life. How? Like, I think I'm going to cry because it just was, you know, when you go into this, something really terrible happens and you feel like you're not good enough. Like something is wrong. I felt like something was wrong with me. It was like maybe he didn't marry me because yeah, you I blamed yourself. Yeah, I you wasn't pretty lo- enough, or I wasn't smart enough. You know. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I didn't know how to cook, or I didn't know how to do all these things. Like I, you like lost enough. myself. Like I wasn't you enough. enough. And when I, the first time I climbed at a climbing gym and I got to the top of the wall, I was like, you know what? Like maybe 
maybe I'm enough, you know, like maybe I can do this. So this figuratively yeah. and yeah. literally this moment of yeah. you could achieve something on your own. Yeah. Wow. So that was 2007. That's like a beautiful metaphor. Thank you. You did it on your own. Thank you. You reached yeah. the top on your own. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I climb, like I climb now. And this is your first time This is my first time climbing. So I'm going to get back to the ex-boyfriend because it is like actually a really good story. So um, I come back to the U.S. in <laughs> okay. 08, I guess. Okay, so from London back to back America. Back to the U.S. Are you, you in know, California? This, was, this or... was, you know, during the recession, and right. my contract was up. My company, the company I was working for, was, like, not doing very well. So I came back to the U.S., and uh, I started climbing here at the local climbing gym here in West L.A. And at this point, I had met my husband, like, on the road. Different story. And I had a different we, husband. Uh, Yes, the husband that You've I'm never, married to now. Right, right. Yes. So, okay. But pres- in the moment, in you're the single. In the present moment, right. Okay, I was right, single, right. Oh, and he Got was it. a climber. Actually, we met at a birthday party, and we talked about rock climbing. And I was like, oh, wow, like, there's this guy. So, anyways, we're now living in L.A. in 2008, yeah. and we were climbing at a climbing gym. And uh, we, were, we met this guy at a climbing gym, and he said he had an idea about starting a climbing gym business because he was going through a divorce and climbing changed his life. Another so the, one. Another guy. So the three of us got together and we're like, you know what? Maybe like somebody, this thing that climbing can help people like get through these difficult moments in their lives. Mm-hmm. So the three of us got together, like we wrote a business plan, like started raising money. And then we decided to start a climbing company. And this was 12 years ago, ish ago. What do you think it is about climbing that makes yeah. people feel like I know a lot of people will find sort of uh, a moment when it comes to like yoga, like there's always this spiritual yeah. or they're at a low and sort of yoga will find whether it's Bikram yoga, hot yoga, whatever it is, mm. it'll find the individual that is looking for something deeper. What is it about climbing? Do you think that obviously you have your own personal story around yeah. connecting to it? What, what was the the people that you're working with, what was the thing that they, like the guy going through the divorce, what was it about climbing that he found to be empowering or I don't know, what, what okay. was it? So it's a couple of things. Cause climbing, it's now become a pretty big sport, it's, which is really crazy. Cause I can't even believe I'm sitting here. Like when we started, I just thought it was the side gig. I honestly thought it was a side gig, but I think climbing, the thing that climbing draws people to is the community aspect of it. Okay. Cause whatever you're going through, right? When you're at the climbing gym and you're sitting around climbing in a group of people, bouldering, like looking at the wall, figuring it out. You're just talking about climbing. You're not talking about, I mean, after the breakup. I've never thought about this. After the breakup, I went through the, there was a splitting of the things and the splitting of the friends, right? And it was like every conversation I was in, it was like, oh, I got married last month or like I did this. Like every phone call I had with my friends, when I called them, I was like, oh, I haven't talked to you for a while. And the first question they asked me was, oh, my God, are you getting married? And I was like, no, I broke up, (laughs) you know. So it was just like I needed this change of conversation to go into the climbing gym and talk about like you can just meet a stranger and you don't have to talk about what you do for a living or what's going on in your life. You talk about this thing on the wall that you're looking at together. I can get it in the sense yeah. of like, this is an int- a different, so tennis for me. Yeah. So I, I learned tennis when I moved to Los Angeles probably seven years ago. And what's interesting for me is that it's not, it wasn't about the community. Tennis, obviously you can't play tennis alone. Yeah. And if you play doubles, there's four of you on a court. So technically there's a lot of community to it because mm-hmm. you know, you're playing with other people. For me, what it was, was more of this, imagine when you're a kid, like let's say 12, 13, like I was pretty good at soccer. But when I was 12 and 13, you know, my focus was like, can I impress girls, basically? And so so sports became an avenue for me to do that. And so I was not what I would call a focused athlete, right? I wasn't trying to get better at the sport. I was just trying to sort of attract a girl. Like that's really, if I boil it down to the simplest facts. So then when tennis started for me, it was more of like, okay, I'm an adult now. Can I approach tennis with an adult mindset, something I don't have any skill in, something I'm starting from zero at, almost like you with climbing, and can I approach that with today's mentality, right? So the Diego of sort of the more mature and really focus on weaknesses. So, so in soccer and in basketball even, if you're righty, you can get pretty far just being righty. Mm-hmm. You'll never become a pro if you don't work your left hand. Yeah. Right? That's generally how it goes. In tennis, it's the same. And so then I was like, okay, can I get, can I create every, everything's a weakness. So can I make a strength? Or how massive can I make the weaknesses into something positive, whether it becomes like like my serve, I would say, is the strongest mm-hmm. uh, skill I have. And so it became interesting where it was like a game to me right? Uh, with a more mature mindset. And so tennis became that. 
Okay. There's another part of tennis where at a club or like a climbing gym, yeah, everyone's there for the same reason. Right. And so it doesn't matter what you do. The yeah. conversations aren't focused in like, like you could play tennis for, with someone for two years and not have any idea don't, yeah, don't that they're what, a producer yeah, right. or a Grammy winner. You don't know anything, mm-hmm. right? And that's really interesting. Yeah, because it's, it's very, not like, about liberating that. and freeing because you feel that you're actually connected to this person on a human level. Right. Yeah. Right. I get that. But what's interesting to me is like for me, tennis was let me take something I'm really bad at, approach yeah. a mindset not of a 13 year old kid, but of the person I am today, mm. and let me see how far I can push it. Hmm. And so it was more about like pushing mental toughness or just pu- pushing mental. I mean, that's there's, what it, yeah. th- there's a part of that for me too, because the other thing is like, I have a lot of stories. I know we all do. Like one of my stories in my life is I'm not an athlete. I have a really hard time identifying with the word athlete because when I was growing up, it was very unstable and I didn't do any sports. And also I'm, I'm actually legally blind. I wear contacts, but if I didn't wear contacts, I couldn't even see you like, like right here. And I was just had flat feet. I didn't do any sports and I was terrible at any ball sports, like really afraid of the ball. Mm -hmm. So because I didn't do any sports until I discovered climbing in my 20s, when someone tells me, wow, that's an amazing thing. You're such an athlete. I would like not be able to receive it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's really interesting. And so you guys are finding community. I get it. And then I assume you want to build it. You want to share the community. And Mm -hmm. so then three of you get together. You put together a business plan. What's your first step? Leasing out a space, finding a space? Like, right. what is that like? So I'm sure you've talked to a lot of different entrepreneurs, like the ones that have raised money from VC. And so I'm probably the... Or angels. Whoever. Yeah, or angels. Yeah, so in the very beginning, it was kind of like a side gig. I thought, you know what? Some people... I mean, I had this amazing career in toys. Like, I wasn't... I loved my job, yeah. right? I was making, like, good money doing it. And I had a mortgage. And my husband was a Harvard educated lawyer. Like we had like real jobs. So um, <laughs> I like that you say real I know, no, job. because some really, people think I don't have a real it's job. It's a really interesting, it's really interesting construct, yeah. the society of what is real what a, job. What is real job is. So you had a salary position. We had a salary position. It was a Got good it. Safe, job. Safe, wonderful. Really safe career. And so I thought, you know what? Some people owned uh, side gigs, like a subway or a coffee shop. I was like, my side gig is going to be a climbing gym. Okay. So... At first, we just run around with our business plans and like ask our friends and family for money. How much money did you ask for? Twenty five thousand like dollars. Okay, anybody so not who much. Wanted to, but the first round, we raised two and a half million in equity and like about a million, a so million you, okay. dollars. So you were always raising company loans. as a, or you're always raising equity as a company, right? Not so much like we're just gonna have this crazy idea. We need enough money to just lease yeah. this space. And no, we raised it. money. You for, realized yeah, you wanted we like to had start a business a plan. Like we do, we knew how to do that. We wrote a business plan. And said, okay, this is what we're gonna build this climbing gym. Yeah. This is how much money we kind of need. And then we got a, we went to like 30 banks and like begged one of them to give us a SBA loan. So we got like an SBA loan and we got like an investor equity. Yeah. And when went around with like a computer, went to a landlord and said, hey, you know what? I know you don't know us. We don't have any experience running climbing gyms, but we want to rent your building. We want to pop a hole in the roof and then like build this 50. I mean, like, have you been to a climbing gym in the last I couple have. years? So okay. I've been, I, I built a brewery next to a climbing okay. gym. So if you've been to Stronghold. Yeah. Okay. okay so right across, literally across the five yeah. is Benny Boy Brewing. Okay. And so that's our brewery cider house. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. And so we went there to sort of just introduce us at okay. the very beginning that's of the cool. project, but I was blown away. Yeah. That's I mean, how it works. Yeah. Well, just, it was beautiful. It mm-hmm. was like majestic yeah. on the inside. So like that building, they didn't have to raise the roof because that was a brewery, but the one, like our first building, it was just a warehouse. Okay. So we literally just like cut half of the warehouse and then built a roof built like a higher roof on top of it. So it was like 18 feet and then 50 feet. But that's how we started our first business. Was and how just much like, does a build out cost on something? Like for your first one, do you remember the first cost one of was the like, build out? Well, it was 3.75 million because that's all the money we had and we ran out of money. So we didn't finish so anything. So it's not cheap. Yeah, it was because it's just the roof raising and the walls alone cost a million dollars. I don't want to get too yeah. in the weeds here, but yeah. when the city, when you submit the drawings to yeah. the city to yeah. build a client, They don't know gym, what it is, like freaking out. Right? Yeah. Yeah, they're like, yeah. How, what do you mean? Well, now it's actually gotten easier and easier because there's I'm more sure. climbing gyms. Like, yeah, there's you were one a down phenomenon the, there's a at down, There's one down the street right now. It's very successful. And we know the owners really well. It's like a different game now, I think, than it was 12 years ago. But yes, for sure, in the beginning, the cities were like, oh, my God. And, you know, they're just freaking out about this thing they don't know what it is. So $3.5 yeah. million you're in. Okay. Yeah. And then is the business plan membership model? Like, how are you guys thinking you're going to get capital from, like, income? Okay, so we went to... On your to, first location. On the first location, we went to, I don't know, probably like 50 climbing gyms in the country. And we just asked people. 
and we would like go to a climbing gym and we would sit there and then we would just like count how many people came in the door and we'd kind of like do the math. Like you can do the math. By the way, I still believe in this. You can go to any business and you can sit there. It's like, it's all public information. You know what I'm telling you? Because you can figure it out by, if you did, if you spend enough time sitting there and counting, you can figure out how much money this business makes, right? So we just like did that, like 50 different climbing gyms. And we thought, wow, you know what? We think we extrapolate, like we think we might have like 800-ish members or we think we might have this members, members okay. at maturity. So then you go times right. dollar amount that right, we right, need. Right, right, right. And you just figure it out. Okay. So, so when then, you first launched, how much was it to become a member? At the time, it was like $75 a month. 75 yeah. bucks. That feels so reasonable. I know. Okay. Yeah. Now you, it's like, now we're like 109, and which you, and is still reasonable. It's, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. super reasonable. Knowing that you can get 800 members yeah. so that you, you know, that the world gets them is right. one thing. Getting right. them is another thing. Yep. So how did you guys get your first group of members? So we came up with this plan, convince a landlord, built the building. So we actually, early on, we met this athlete. His name is Kush Sharma. You can look him up. He's actually one of our investors and a friend of ours. Okay. What is he? What, what, what sport? Uh, climbing. He's okay, a really climbing. famous climber. So we actually got, got a climber to kind of be the front end to do marketing for that us. That was a we dumb did question. Like, <laughs> you're like, what's He's sport? a baseball player. He's a baseball player. Obviously. So, but we just said, you know, we did, we did a lot of marketing in the beginning and like we got people to show up, but it, it was funny. Cause like, I, I still believe in this. I, I talked to my friend Steven about this. It's like every time I open a new location, I'm opening one in 20 days, right? 20 days, June 12th. And I know people care about it and I know it's going to be successful because I've done the, t the research and we've had events and hundreds of people have shown up, but it's like always the day of the grand opening. I wake up in the morning and I don't know if people are going to come. Do you know what I mean? Chefs feel that. Right? You're like, are people, do people actually like I don't this have that. Don't? I've had several yeah. grand openings. Yeah. And I've always told all the entrepreneurs that I work yeah. with, double the quantity of whatever you think yeah. is enough for that day. Really? And every grand opening I've ever had has been their best day that year. That's awesome. Like, like yeah. basically, let's say the rent number, it's, they've made three times the rent number. Hmm. And it's for two reasons. One, we as landlord, we as developer, do a tremendous amount of PR for them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, there's a lot of people that are coming, yeah. no matter what, just based on our work. Yeah. And so you know, if they have one friend, that will still be a successful yeah. day. But anyways, back to that very, very first grand opening. So I show up, right? Like six o'clock in the morning, clean the gym, get ready, do a huddle with my team. So I go out to the parking lot and there was two people at nine o'clock waiting outside the door. So I go and talk to them. And I said, hey, you know what? We're opening at 10 o'clock, come back in an hour. And the, the two guys were like, you know what? We've heard about this gym for so long and we drove all the way out here from Arizona. What? So we're just gonna stay here and wait in line. To the Why do you think opens. they waited? Was there something different that you guys were offering to the market that wasn't seen before? You know, because when we built that first location at the time, it was like never done before. It was just so unique. Okay, it was so early. It was very early, Got sort it. of in this like climbing gym boom. And that okay. day, I remember like over a thousand people came through the door that day. Wow! Like the whole day, there was a line out the door the whole day, and it was incredible. It was just, I can close my eyes and I still see it. It's crazy. Okay, so you got one. Yeah. You found the success. You see the model working. Yeah. Then you decide to do it again. Yeah. Similar, same success. At that point, you had already sort of, you know, the right. unknowns. It's a little different here right, and there. It's a little different there. But I think, like, there's a couple of things. I think we made some very conscious decisions that led to a different path, right? I think people go through this. So the first one, it was like, hey, this is a side gig. And at some point I realized, you know what? This is not a side gig. Yeah. You know, we hit, we hit 800 num members like faster than you can imagine. It was like, wow, you know, these numbers are totally not real. This is doing way better than I thought. So I ended up quitting my job a year into it. And my husband quit his job. My, my business partner quit his job er earlier. And now we're all three of us like trying to figure it out in this thing. And then we decided, okay, so are we going to try to open another location? Like, what do we want to do with this thing right now that we're all like in it? Yeah. So then we decided to open another location here in L.A., and actually opening, I'd say opening the second one was in a lot of ways like harder than the first one. It was really hard. So this is what I want to yeah. get into for a second. Yeah. So I think like the way I describe real estate development yeah. is the first time you do it, yeah. you don't know anything. Yes, you're right. So I yeah. almost look at it like an Everest, like you're just jacked up and you're excited and you just want to get that one. Yeah. The second time you do it, you're kind of like, oof. Because you know everything yeah. now, or you, you know think you do. There's some like, things, you but know then there's things, things you don't know. Like COVID will hit or something right, will happen. Right, right. New politician, yeah. the city changes something, it gets interesting. Then the third time you do it, you're kind of like, why, why do I keep doing this? And then the fourth time you do it, you're really like, why do I keep doing this? Yeah. Right? And so I want to hear from your perspective in the gap between the second and third time. Like, 
because it's not sexy anymore. It's not fun. In the sense of where it's when it's new, it's fun. It's exciting. Mm-hmm. I'm going to answer this question like a different way. But yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. promise yeah. I will. So I, I did a talk recently at UCLA and people asked me, um, it's about like p- turning your passion into your purpose. Okay. And they asked me, you know, why do you do this? Because I'm a clearly like a passion turned purpose person, right? Yeah. And I said, look, for the first one, it was because I was truly passionate about climbing. And I still am. I climb all the time and I love it, right? Yeah. But at some point, it wasn't enough anymore, Diego. Do you, do you know what I mean? I it just wasn't enough. And I had to find a new purpose. And what I discovered my new purpose was, Ugh. and that was the moment I decided, you know what, I'm going to massively expand now, is I decided it wasn't about like the number of gyms that I was building. It was about the number of people that I was impacting and specifically mm-hmm. the number of careers I was creating. Like one of the most memorable moments yeah. that I have actually was like the first time I paid somebody else $100,000 in my company. Yeah. Because this is a real job now. You know that? Like, and going back to the thing about our parents, like my, my mom has always been very supportive of my business. But, you know, some of the other people in my family, my extended family, they just, they never approved of it, you know? And yeah. it's just like, what respectable Asian person starts a climbing gym business? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you're a phenomenon. I mean, that's and, interesting. And especially, uh, so we just got a lot of that, like, oh, you're crazy. You should sell your business. Especially during COVID, a lot of our relatives was like, oh, well, see, I told you so. You should sell your business now because you know, this is not a thing. And like, I, I just think that like, like we're actually creating career opportunities for people who are really passionate about climbing and like they can make this their real career. And they have families and you're yes. the whole bit. Yes. Yeah. yeah I totally get that. I think for me, yeah. there's two things. One, when we start a project, you know, we're certainly employing a lot of construction workers, right? So in your case, 3.5 million, obviously that money is being spent uh, on construction. And when people ask me why I don't do residential like development, I just tell them, look, if I build, let's just say I build a 50 unit apartment complex. Cool. Let's say all those people, all 50 units have a Thanksgiving and they're all hosted there. So at most, maybe during the year I've impacted 2000 people, maybe Mm -hmm. I was like, if I build a restaurant, a coffee shop, you're talking about thousands of people per week Mm -hmm. that we're impacting. And so to me, when I just think about energy in impact is massive, Mm -hmm. Right. And if I can create a a place where you meet your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, a friend, then like we've created a moment where it's not just job, it's jobs also, Mm -hmm. but it's also now you've literally impacted someone's life, someone's trajectory. I love what you said. That's beautiful. I live my life like moment to moment. I remember these moments. Like when I die, which we're all going to one day, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. I'm (laughs) only the only thing I'm going to have is these moments of my life, you know, these memories of like the things that happened, like the day at the grand opening or like this conversation or like the people that I spend time with. And I just try, I try really hard to remember that, you know, otherwise you get lost in the money and the fame and the ego and the, it's like everything else is just like vanity. I think for me, it's always stories. Yeah. Like, cause I I think about my grandparents, like my grandfather had the best stories Mm -hmm. and I always think like when I die, no one will care about the money and none of that will matter. Yeah. But I better have some cool stories. Yeah. And so it's my job to go collect these cool stories. stories. I like my stories. What's your yeah. best story? Okay, well, the when athlete you, one's pretty good. Okay, okay, do you want to hear about the ex-boyfriend one? Because it's really good. I haven't yes. finished that. So the ex-boyfriend, we left that hanging. So, okay. Let's in close 2008, the loop. 2009, 10, like right before I was starting my climbing gym business, so he three called years. me. Okay. And uh, just out of the blue, and he was like, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing? And I was like, well, you know what? Thanks to you, I actually started climbing, and I'm starting this climbing gym business now. You said thanks to you. I did. I actually said, you know what? I'm so glad that this happened. And he said that he he ended up moving to Hong Kong, right, working for a hedge fund, and he did really well that year, like made hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow, personally. And he said, you know what? I would like to invest in your business. And I said, the first thought I said was, you know what? If you want to buy your guilt, like, I don't want your money. But oh actually. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's what you <laughs> Something said? Something like that, yeah. That's a good line. But it's my like husband. A movie out here. I know, it's a movie. But my husband actually, like, talked to me into it. you want to buy your guilt? Yeah, yeah. Bars. Because I was so mad at him. That's a rap bar. You should have so told Drake to yeah. use that on Kendrick. That's so good. Okay. But I ended up taking his investment. I did. My husband actually convinced me. You took the guilt. If someone offers you money, you take it. You take it. it. But That's my husband said, you know what, Alice? One. This is what he's like. It was like really good. It was like really an amazing story. My, my husband said, you know, Alice, you had these five amazing years with this man. Like you really loved him, right? And I was like, yeah, it was like a, an amazing time. It was like it ended really badly, but it doesn't have to, you don't have to remember it that way. Like you can rewrite how that's going to be. Yeah. 
So I took his money and fast forward. Now it's like 12 years later, right? He's like one of my largest investors. And we've become friends again. Like I've met his wife, which is the same woman he married when after we broke up. And she's an amazing person. And actually, you know what? Years later, like a couple years ago, I was having dinner with him and I asked him, I was like, you know what? I just want to know. Did we break up because I wasn't good enough? Did you really think that you didn't want me to go to Hong Kong because I wasn't good enough or like I was fat or whatever, ugly, whatever. And he said, you know, I just didn't want you to go because I really truly believed you wouldn't be happy in Asia. He goes, look at you now. He goes, I always, I've always believed in your ability and I think you're an amazing entrepreneur, but for some reason you just, you thought you weren't good enough. And it was, mm. it was like so amazing because I made up so many stories. In your head. To, in my head, because I needed that story to, I don't know, to move on, I guess. Like I made him evil. So what happened yeah. <laughs> after that? So, I mean, like now so we're when he friends. Said that, yeah. Did you feel I like... was just crying? I was sitting in a restaurant. I was bawling. I was like, you know, I'm really sorry. And I said, I told him, I was like, you know, I'm really sorry that I made you wrong. I'm really sorry that I told the story as you as an evil person because it was never like that. It was in my head. Yeah. And he said, and he said something like, you know, I forgive you because that's what you needed at the time to get through what you needed to get through. And like, I'm really glad we are where we are. What a beautiful so, fucking And you know what? Like, tie-in. even the whole thing, like, like, the first check he wrote me, maybe because he was guilty. I don't know. Maybe it was, right? <laughs> okay. But the next, whatever, five checks he's written, it's because I actually run a very successful business you and deliver. I'm really good at what I do. You're an entrepreneur, yeah. Right. So, but I think that holding on to the idea that he gave me money because he was guilty is actually what's stopping me from doing what I'm able to do. Do you so, know what I mean? Of course I know it's what like, you mean. I really believe that we have to start letting go of these stories yes. in our heads. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's so much there. I think the reality of entrepreneurship in general or just humanity is like you really like I wake up feeling really lucky every day. Yeah, me too. And I some people will will hear this and think it's a skill or, or like a tactic I use. Yeah. But to me, it's like when my problems aren't health related or like family related, when my problems are just opportunity driven, mm-hmm. that's pretty amazing, you know, yeah. and and I just feel lucky, yeah. I guess. And, and that that beginning of my day in that mode sets the tone for really no negative talk or because it's hard to do what we do in the sense of like you really play mental gymnastics with yourself and you can get dark real quick it doesn't take that much yeah right you could sleep bad yeah and and not have the energy to tell yourself the good story i get like bad one bad yelp review and i was like oh i suck at my job it's really (laughs) easy to do that it's really easy to throw you off yeah Yeah. it's like a balance beam all the time and then you're shocked at like how easy it is for someone to kick you off your balance it's kind of amazing it's true that's a beautiful story. Thank you. And it worked See, it's out. a good story, right? It's a it's good, a good story. story. And I'm going to send him this podcast. I mean, I send him all my interviews and stuff. So he, he knows that I'm talking about it this why, way. Yeah. Why the name Sender One? What does that mean? So uh, Send comes from a, it's a short, like a, I'm losing my thought, but it comes from the word Ascend, like to climb to the top. Okay. But when you actually sit around and you watch climbers climb, what they say is like, send this. That's send like it. a slang. Yeah. Yeah. In climbers. tech, it's like ship it. Yeah, kind of yeah, like that. Full yeah. send. Okay. And, and we then just Sender didn't, one we is didn't like... want like a name like rock or stone or I don't know. You know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And how many locations do you have now? So we have four now, but we're opening one, as you know, in 20 days mm-hmm. in Lakewood. So that'll be number five. That'll be number five. And then we have some other projects like in the pipe, some some of them in the pipeline, some that I've announced, some I haven't. But uh, the next one, uh, a big gym is in Aliso Viejo, like South Orange County. Yeah. And yeah. is the membership model that they can go to any of the gyms? Yeah, they can go to any of the gyms. Okay. Yeah. I want you to give the entrepreneur who's thinking about this, let's say they have one location of something today. Yeah. And they might be doing a membership model, probably they're doing a membership model. Yeah. Uh, for some people, they go, oh, if they're going to open up your second one, maybe you thought this too. Am I yeah. going to cannibalize the first? How will this work? Yeah. Did, do the numbers ever exponentially go up? Will like you open in terms of one, the memberships? Yeah. Or is it... So, okay, it depends, right? So like we opened... Like debunk the fear of the entrepreneur yeah. thinking, if I open up a second one... It's going to steal from myself. Steal and not yeah. grow. What's... First of all, it will steal from yourself. This is the thing. It's like, you're... this is how I think about it. Somebody is going to steal from me. If I don't steal from myself, someone's going to steal from me. It's actually oh, naive to think that no one's going to come Someone's going to take it anyway. Yeah, someone's going to take it. So you, you might as well be you. Yourself. Exactly. Fuck yeah. So when we opened our second one, it was further, f- far enough That's apart. That's another bar. You should just it was That's so good. Yeah. Okay. Well, we were far enough apart that uh, we didn't really steal from ourselves. Like, we, But this one that's opening in Lakewood, we are for sure going to steal from ourselves. And that's good because the other thing is we have like parking problems and like some of the gyms are like the Orange County one is really busy. And I don't, this is one of those things I fight against, right? It's like, 
I'm, I, he, I read the reviews and I read the surveys. We have a pretty good system. And people are like, oh, I have to wait in line. There's no parking. I don't want to come anymore. And to me, I was like, what do you mean? It doesn't even seem that busy. But people, people's perception is their reality. So they think it's busy. So by opening a gym and like letting them go to the other one, then it will spread out and then it can get filled in by new people. If you're a Sender One fan, yeah. please go to Yelp right now <laughs> and give Alice some peace. <laughs> give her some grace and write a nice review. I'll, oh, I'll do you. it later yeah. too. But anyways, but yeah, that, that happens. It happens, but it's intentional. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. But did you know that at the gate or were you like, like as you're opening up location right. number two, did you know that or were you convinced of that later? Where you steal uh, from yourself. I think I was convinced from that like later for okay. sure. When, but like I said, when we opened our second one, it was far enough apart. It was like a 40. I mean, it was how far is Santa Ana from L.A.? Like 30 miles. But 30 miles is like an hour and a half on the 405. Depending on the yeah. time, it could be terrible. Yeah. OK, as you think about scaling the business, is it a function of how many people do you employ at a time? About 200. 200 at a time. Okay. Well, no, right now we're at about 200, but each location, depending on if it's like a bigger gym or a bouldering gym, it's between, I don't know, 20 to 70. Yeah. Okay. Will you disclose any revenue numbers as a company? Uh, no. Or per location? Yeah. No. But it's profitable? Yeah. Healthy? Yeah. Like healthy it's a good margin? Business. Yeah. Well, it's a good enough business that private equity is coming into the business. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, if you know what I mean. I do yeah. know what you mean. Okay. And then when you think about where you want to take this company overall, do you think about national expansion or just regional expansion? How do you, if you had a crystal ball, you say, okay, by 2028, this is how many locations I'd like to have? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel like you're in a good spot? So early on, we were very distracted. Like people would come to me and say, hey, I want to give you some money. Like, come open a gym in, like, this other state. Or, like, come opening a gym in China. Like, I've gotten, actually, a lot of that, actually. But I've come to realize, like, you have to, um, you know, I'm really big on getting mentors and people to help you, guide you in your journey. And I've kind of realized, you know what, I have to remember why I did it or what, what am I doing it for. Like, I love living here in California. And I love that I can drive to all of the gyms and travel and, and get to them and climb there and like meet the people and be part of the community. So for now, I don't want to go anywhere else. So I'm very focused on building out my little empire in the LA area. So the other thing that's happening is climbing is in the Olympics. So it's coming to LA in 28. So I have, what are we, 24, four years to build out a couple more gyms in LA. And we have some locations that we've already scouted that we like. So I'm going to stay focused on building here for the next couple of years. Okay. Yeah. And then at some point, do you own the real estate? Do you no, lease the real I estate? I wish I could. Okay. If I it's was a different some, game. Yeah, if it's a different game. Yeah. That's always the tough part where it's like, if once you get investment, it's also, it's such a distraction to try to own the real, it's a different product, it's, yeah, it's a different, right? I mean, As a business. We've talked about getting another real estate investment like company to lease it back to the company. Like there's different options. It just hasn't like the numbers haven't penciled out. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. of the rent negotiation, probably. Because yeah. if you if you do buy the building, the rent would have to be a premium right. number, which right. probably makes things or could makes things difficult on the labor side. I haven't given up on the idea. I'd like to try it. How much space do you need? So the one like in Lakewood, for example, it's twenty nine thousand square feet. Okay. It, we went into a we're going into an old office max. Okay, yeah. that's cool. And so the play is really like you can buy any warehouse. It doesn't matter the height, and then you just you yeah. put a hole in the roof and you build up. Yeah, you build up. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And how do you do it? Is it just like, what is it? Is it steel? What are you erecting? What are you putting in there to hold it up? So this is not my area of expertise, so I'll talk about it in the way that I understand. But basically, you just hire a steel roof building company, okay. and then they dig a hole in the thing, and then they put a new roof on with like new <laughs> steel structures. Like, okay. that's it. Yeah. Okay. Like a butler building, yeah. I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Okay. But there that's... are different ways to do it. People do it different ways. And so at this point, the way you look at the trajectory is you're building your empire locally. It doesn't sound like you'll need more capital for these two locations. Maybe yeah, a little not bit, for but now. not, like, not life-changing capital. Right now. Yeah, I, we haven't like really raised a serious round in a while yeah. now, just because the, the, a lot of the profits from the company are kind of going back to growing and building new locations. Will you eventually sell this? Maybe during the Olympics, you, you sort of button this up. I don't know. Up? You know, people ask me all the time too, and I this is how I answer it. Right? I was like, yeah. What if do you I'm, tell your investors? What Let's I tell start my investors? Oh, yeah, I should tell my employees. Like, I'm really transparent about this. Like, I don't believe in having two different sets of stories. And like, this is going to go public and someone's going to read it or, or watch it. Look, I'm having a ball. Like, I'm having a blast right now. I've never had so much fun running my business. So I'm just not done. And so I don't know. When I am no longer having fun anymore, I'll think about it. <laughs> but right now, I am like, just, it's really exciting and fun and your business partners yeah. you guys are all still getting along everything's chill no so you know what um 
my business, one of my business partners left the business yeah. five, almost five years ago now. So it's just me and my husband. Okay. Yeah. That's a different story. A sad story. But sad, like health sad or like, no, just like, like a breakup. Yeah. It's like almost kind of like a breakup. Yeah. I had a company, there was three of us once. And then what's interesting, I mean, this is, I think somewhat normal, but one of you will work less hard than the other two always. Yeah. And, and when and that happens, there's like, yeah. what the fuck? There's always like some reason. And I don't, it's like not one person is wrong or right. right. It's just like, it just didn't it's work. It's a life path. Yeah, it's just a life Some path people want to move. Work. They don't want to be in California anymore. Right. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. That happened to me in my first business. And it's like, and it's more common than people think it is. It's way more common. And I was like, and don't denial. be afraid of it. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. the thing I learned was also just talk to the person that you're trying to get rid of Yeah. and say like, what do you want? Right. Don't get lawyers involved. Yeah. Just have the easy conversation. It's going to feel very mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Yeah. But at least for me, that person told us exactly what they wanted. That's great. Which was far less than what we thought mm-hmm. in our heads. Mm-hmm. And it became an easy exit. And somehow we were able to, we did get lawyers involved at the beginning though. But then I was like, let's just have this conversation. Yeah. Like I said, it happens more often than people think. Yeah. yeah. Well, for people listening, where can they sign up for your business? How much is it? All the things. Yeah. Okay. So you can go to our website, which is www.sender.one or senderoneclimbing.com. Uh, the easiest way to get started actually is to take an intro to climbing class. And we teach that every day. And on the weekends, we teach that every hour on the hour. And how much we is that? We are really big on like teaching beginners. It's $39. Yeah. Okay. That's and cheap. It comes, yeah. And it's... It, an hour of instruction it comes with all the rental gear you need shoes and harness and chalk bags and we'll teach you how to get on the wall so 100 percent of the time on your first day you will climb to the top of a wall <laughs> people don't believe me but i'm like no you can do it that speaks to you yeah. that speaks to your story your yeah. personal story yeah so it's easier than people think then think, people think yeah because you can just pull them up or <laughs> well because there's really easy things like sort of like ladders okay. there's different grades of climbing so there's very very easy ones and really really hard ones yeah, so we have just routes that are just designed for beginners, right? So that's for like the rope climbing. And if you go to a bouldering gym, it's just a pair of shoes. And same thing, we have classes. that will teach you how to get on the wall. But you can get on the wall on your first try. Alice, Sender One Climbing. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.